So we're not opposed to phones and texting and unless you're in staff here and you have to text somebody about something in the service, please don't be on your phones. I, I want to talk to you tonight. Amen. I think that should be every time the Word of God goes I know it's exciting and, and we live in an instant information age and I try not to be an old fogey. Okay? And uh, I know you have a good service of people shouting and the cameras go up and they're videoing it and then they're posting it on, you know, right out of the service. It's like a live time service, you know. Uh, I'd rather you be worshiping God than doing that. If it's that good that you've got to take pictures of it and you break out of it, you are missing out. Amen. And so let's try to keep the technology in its proper place. I, I love technology. I use it myself. But uh, it can get you to where you, it'll drag you away from the things of God to where you might miss out on something. And I think that it's real important that you uh, understand some things here. I'm very happy to talk about uh, a topic Brother Eric started and, and launched us out in uh, the this, this series of holiness. And we're going to talk about our apparel today, or tonight, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, and then uh, chapter 7 and verse 1. Uh, the apostle says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? He's asking a rhetorical question here. And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Amen. Aren't you glad that God will? And will be a father unto you, and, shall, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Almighty. Wow, what an what a, what a invitation to come out of something into something. Amen. And God actually makes us sons and daughters in the kingdom. And then he goes on to say in chapter 7, he says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Of God amen and so we want to look at holiness by God's design because God's the only one that's holy and God's designed this thing called holiness that we're looking at and the beauty of holiness and I hope that you'll understand it a little better uh, we're going to talk about the biblical standard of apparel maybe you didn't know it but the Bible talks a lot about apparel it, it mentions it a lot it instructs us in it and and we're going to look at that Number one is God uses apparel to separate us. He does. There's, there's, a, there's a separation that goes on. And so we live in a world, but we're not of the world. God calls us out of the world. He said, come out from among them and be ye separate. So part of that is uh, of our lifestyle is by what we wear as Christian believers. Amen. And so a maturing Christian, a Christian that comes in and starts to grow in God will understand and want to understand these concepts and principles in the Word of God because this is going to help you draw closer to God. It will guard you from making mistakes in your life that you might later regret uh, or might even cause you to miss out altogether eventually with God. And so it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Amen. Now, let me just, on the onset of this, um, you don't dress a certain way to be saved, okay? You're not saved by how you dress. It doesn't work that way, okay? So that's not what I'm teaching here tonight, just so you get that clear. Uh, but let me just say this. Once you're saved, you will change the way you dress because as you grow in God, you're going to want to learn the Word of God you know, the, the children of, of, of Israel had a real problem with Gentiles coming into the church. And in the 15th chapter of Acts, they invited the Gentiles then to be a part of it. And they, they, they had a big conference and a debate on what they would require of Gentiles to be a part of the church. And, and the letters went out to the Gentile churches 
that seemed good to the apostles that were there and the elders in Jerusalem and to the Holy Ghost that they put not on them, this, these infant believers, these new babes in the Lord, anything more than these necessary things. And it was moral purity and it was abstinence uh, from things of blood, okay? Eating them, uh, things offered to idols and, and eating things that were not bled properly that were strangled to death. And so that was very important because way back in Genesis 9, God gave flesh for man to eat. Before that, man ate, was a, a, a vegetarian. And, but he said, you will not eat the blood with the flesh because the blood was separated for atonement. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So God has stipulated throughout from the beginning of time that he let man start to eat flesh that we would not ingest blood. Gentiles did that on a regular basis. Even today, people eat blood pudding and blood sausage and things of that nature. Uh, those are forbidden for Christians to eat, okay? And so maybe you didn't even know that, but we don't participate in that because God has said this. And so that's good enough for me. God says, you don't do it? I say, no argument here. Amen. I want to do what the Lord wants to do. I want to be pleasing to him. But, but how do we live in a, a holy life and still maintain a balanced life? Can we do that? Can we in 2015 live a holy life in an ungodly world and still have a balanced life? Amen. Because God has not called us to isolationism. He didn't want us to become a cult and to go get a, 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 a track of land out in Montana and build a, build a community there and put gates around it and fences and lock ourselves in. And, and, but, but we do need to be uh, insulated from the world. We do need to understand that even though we're in the world, we can't allow the things of this world to affect us because they will and they do on a regular basis. And so we have to be wise of that and understand that our concepts and our principles and our lifestyles are not governed by what the world does, but by the Word of God as Christians. Amen. And how many are Christians here? Uh, you're good. I got the right crowd to talk to then. Amen. So we will live holy lives, and we're going to win the prize that it brings us. Amen. Because there is a prize to live in holiness, uh, a lifestyle. Now, let, let's look here uh, at Samuel uh, going out to anoint a king, and God told him to go to Jesse's house and, and he was going to anoint a king there but he couldn't find it and of course you know the story how David was and, and he questioned you know surely the biggest brother the oldest brother would have been the one that Samuel would have chosen but it wasn't and he went through all the seven brothers and finally they got David but the explanation was this but the Lord said unto Samuel look not what look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as a man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the inward, uh, or looketh on the heart. Okay, and so right away the argument is, okay, God doesn't care about the outside. He doesn't look on the outside. That's not what he said. In choosing somebody in leadership, God doesn't look at, the, at that individual the way we would look at them. Okay, God never said the outside's not important there. He just said in this choice, you're looking at something that you, don't, you can't see. I look at the heart. And let me just say this, true holiness has to start in the heart. If, it does, if you don't fall in love with God and love holiness and love, because God is holy. If you love the things of the world more than you love God, you're not going to make it. And so... We understand that, and so God doesn't look on the outward appearance, but man does. You can't look at my heart. I can't look at your heart. Now, I can look at what you do. I can look at your fruit. I can look at how you appear, and, and that's all I can do, and there's nothing else I can do. I, don't, I can't read your mind. I don't want to read your mind. It might scare me if I did. You surely don't want to read my mind. You'd think, oh, my God, I'm leaving the church, you know. But God, God looks on the inside, but we look on the outside. So the outside is a, rep, is a representation and a reflection uh, because no one, uh, you don't know what I am inside. All you know is what I appear. And, and I understand that can be false too. But we, we can't neglect the outside. So your dress makes a statement about you. Okay? Your apparel identifies you and it helps amplify 
what's on the inside. Your apparel, what you have on, identifies you. It says who you are. Clothes are very revealing on who we are. You could tell somebody's vocation by the clothes they wear. Who are those gentlemen there? What do they do for a living? Anybody know? Police officer, yeah. How could you tell? How could you tell? Now, if they were in scrubs and they were, or maybe just in street clothes, you might not know, but their apparel identifies them. Amen. Who's that beautiful young lady there? What's she do for a living? Anybody know what she did for a living? A nurse. How did you know that? That's amazing. What, what about these fellas? What do they do for a living? Yeah, they're firemen. How did we identify that? Amen. We identified it by what they were wearing. Now, of course, today in the hospitals, you go and you don't, they don't use the clothes that identify them anymore. I don't know if it's the housekeeping coming in or a nurse. They just they get away from that. But, but your clothes do say a statement about you. Now, this young man, uh, the way he's dressed and what he's doing, it, it resembles something that we identify readily. Uh, we know where he's at. And so uh, that's where a lot of us were at. We were sinners. Paul said in Romans 6 and 17, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Were. We used to do those things. But ye have obeyed from the heart of the form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Amen. What a change between those two young men. Amen. Well, when something changes on the inside, it works its way to the outside. And so there's some things that we have to look at. Uh, being made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Now God made us free from sin. Now we serve righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness, unto holiness. Okay? Unto holiness. For when ye were servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. When I was a servant to sin, I didn't, I didn't have to live holy. I didn't live holy. I was free from that. I was a sinner didn't matter what fruit had ye as a sinner then in those things which are now ye are now ashamed we're not proud of what we used to do now are we back then we thought it was big stuff now we look and think oh man was I stupid right Isn't that the way it works you wonder why why did I think I was so smart when I was doing such dumb stuff well that's the way sin works and so the fruit of that for the end of those things is death. But let's look here. But being now made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness. And what happens? And the end, everlasting life. So holiness is the fruit that leads us to everlasting life. Do you think you can see God without holiness? No. The Bible says clearly, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And so, being free from sin, now we, we have fruit, and we have to bear that fruit, and that fruit is going to identify us as Christians. You know, talking in tongues doesn't just necessarily mean you receive the Holy Ghost. There needs to be fruit that the Spirit has entered in and changed your life. You understand what I'm saying? You could get all confused and, and tongue-tied and say, oh, I got it. Or, or you could have uh, somebody teach you what they call now in the charismatic movement your prayer language and say, I have the Spirit. And they just say, you know, repeat these syllables and you just repeat them and say, okay, you got it. Well, that's, that's foolishness. But when you get the Spirit of God, it changes you. It should change you. It will change you if you got it. And then you have to yield to that. Okay? Now, if you don't want to continue in your Christian walk, you're wasting your time coming to church because God is going to require fruit of you unto holiness. God requires fruit. When he goes to the tree and inspects the tree, what's he do to a tree that doesn't have fruit? 
he cuts it down and he burns it. So I want fruit, I want good fruit, and I want fruit unto holiness. Now, there's two major uh, but basic concepts of dress to remember about holiness. One, modesty, and we're going to talk about that tonight. And then distinction, amen. We are, are, we're definitely uh, sets us apart from each other. And so modesty, what is that? What's modesty? Well, I think Webster has a good definition of it. The quality of behaving and especially dressing in a way that do not attract sexual attention. That's what modesty is. Did you know that you can dress to attract sexually? You can. That's right. That's, that's what the devil wants you to do as Christians. He wants you to be earthy. He wants you to be sensual. He, he wants you to be sexually active outside of the bounds of marriage. And so the way he does that is he, he gets you to dress the way he wants you to dress. But I want to dress to please the Lord. Now, what I'm teaching here, I don't want you to go out here and, and if you decide that you want to grow and you, you understand this and, and somebody says, well, why do you dress like that? And you say, well, that's the way my pastor teaches it. Well, that's the way my church teaches it. You know what? They're going to say, yeah, okay. Yeah, my church teaches, teaches it. But if you say, this is the way the Bible teaches it. You understand what I'm saying? This isn't Brother Huba's standard. This isn't Brother Eric's standard. This is the Word of God. And so we're, we're Christians, and we believe the Word of God. Amen. So uh, modesty is freedom from conceit and vanity and uh, propriety in dress, speech, or conduct. I mean, it's important for us as Christians to understand all about modesty because let me tell you something. We're all wired differently. Men are wired different than men, women, and women are wired different than men. And, and we're going to look at this in the dress. And, and there's a reason why the Word of God teaches these things. It's for our benefit, and it's for our safety. It's for our preservation. Uh, it's for our marriages. And so we're going to look at some of these things. Now, who uh, is qualified to define what modesty is or who sets the standard? I mean, does the pastor do it? Uh, do the church elders do it? Who sets it? Uh, uh, let's, let's just take a look at where all this uh, dress code or standards started, okay? Where's the original design of modesty? Where did it come from? Well, we know that back in the beginning, there were no clothes. Adam and Eve were naked, and that wasn't a problem. They were naked, and they were not, the Bible says, ashamed. They were not ashamed. Isn't that neat? There was no lust driving them. There was no awkwardness. There was no embarrassment. There was no shame. It was just whatever, you know, it's great. You know, they, 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 not, there, was no, there was nothing in their minds that was corrupt and, and ungodly, no thought process. They were innocent. They were in harmony with God until Satan came and deceived Eve, and she ate of the tree and gave the fruit to Adam, and they sinned, and then sin. Ident they got the knowledge of good and evil now. Now, all of a sudden, they realize their nudity and they're, they're covering up. And the first thing they do is what? It appears they got the standard of modesty because they, they went out and made aprons of leaves to cover themselves up. So there's the first dress code the ones, the perpetrators of sin, the ones that defied God's word and law, decided they're going to cover themselves now because they had sinned, okay? Well, that's what the Bible says. The eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked. Now they have shame, don't they? Before, the Bible says they had no shame. Now they're ashamed. They're naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons, Okay? Look at this. Look at how feeble attempt man makes to cover his sin. This is man's idea of dealing with his nudity now. And so he makes, he makes these, this apron. They, they sew leaves together and they, they do that. But it's not a very durable covering, is it? What happens when you pl pluck a leaf from a plant? Give it three days. 
it's going to be falling off your apron. It's not going to last very long. <laughs> what were they thinking? They weren't. They were trying to cover their sin with their own ideas. Okay? And you will always think that you can have the answer to cover what you did wrong. But you don't. It's not lasting, and it's not the plan of God. And so uh, that covering that they did, it didn't remove their shame. They were still shamed with their covering. You know why? They still hid themselves from God. If their covering would have sufficed, they'd have come out when God spoke. They wouldn't have been ashamed. But it wasn't enough, and they knew it wasn't enough, and it didn't work, and they were ashamed to even appear before God. That's what sin will always try to do to us, get us to stay away from God. Sin will always try to separate you from God. Amen. So you can see an apron doesn't cover very much, does it? Now, if I would take the other clothes off that guy, you'd be shocked. It just... Aren't you glad I left the clothes on? No free shows in church tonight. All right, so let's look here. Let's look at what Jesus said. We, if we want to know where modesty starts, we've got to go back to the beginning. Everything starts back to the beginning. They were talking about the bill of divorcement that Moses gave them, and they were trying to trick Jesus. Jesus responded to them in this manner. Jesus said un, and said unto them, answered, for the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Okay, one and two. Opposites. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. What's that got to do with clothing? I'll tell you, it has everything to do with clothing because it goes back to the garden where God made a man and a woman and they were in innocence until sin came in and that's where God established the dress code of modesty in the garden. It didn't come from any culture. It didn't come from any church board or pastor. It started in the beginning, just like marriage started in the beginning. It all went back to the garden, and God himself established the dress code uh, for Adam and Eve. Let's, let's look at the scriptures here and look at different versions. It says, Unto Adam also and his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. Now, God's plan was to cover them, Okay? Their plan, which didn't really do anything and wasn't lasting and it didn't remove any of the shame, uh, was leaves. That was their foolish plan. But God said, that's not enough and it's not the right way to do it and it's not going to last. So God slew some animals. There was death and there was shedding of blood for those skins. And he took those skins and made them coats and gave that to them so that they would be covered a little more than an apron. Okay? Now, when we look at the Amplified Version, it says, And Adam also and his wife, the Lord God, made long coats or tunics okay, of skin and clothed them. And then the, the New King James Version also makes reference also, uh, For Adam and his wife, the Lord God, made tunics of skin and clothed them. So Adam and Eve uh, were clothed by God. God set the standard and that word that's used there is kudina, okay? And that word talks about a, a specific design of a garment. It's called a tunic, okay? And we're going to look at that. And what did God have to say about it, okay? This isn't a cultural thing. You know, when, when, when Brother Tao and Brother uh, uh, Noah started wearing these lava lavas around here, I didn't know what to make about that. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's a cultural thing in Samoa. It's modest. It's just, I've never seen guys wearing dresses unless they were Scottish, you know. Of course, I wasn't going to make fun of Tower Noah, you know. 
I'm not that stupid. <laughs> It'll break me like a pretzel. But you can see that there's different dresses and, and cultural dresses that are acceptable in some places and are, seem strange to others. I mean, it doesn't seem strange in Samoa that, that the men are running around in dresses. They wrap themselves in these wraps and, you know, uh, they, you know, it's just part of their culture. So it's, you know, what God had established is before there ever was a culture. You understand that? So when you, when you look at cultures, cultures change and they vary. Our culture is rapidly changing. For the worse, I should say. Okay? It's drifting further and further away from what God had designed. If it's a cultural thing, does it make it right if it's not what God said? No. God's the one that sets the standard of modesty, not our culture, not ungodly people, and not the clothing designers of this modern day. Matter of fact, most of those guys that dress, that dress up women don't even like women. They're designing how women ought to look, and they think they tell you how you ought to look, ladies. And You know, ladies, I'm thankful for godly apostolic ladies. I am. Now, the standard is the same for the men and the women. Unfortunately, in our culture for the ladies, you might stick out just a little more than the men. It's just the way it is. And that's because our culture has changed few years ago that wouldn't have been the case but it is today so as believers we're wanting to please the Lord we want to do what the Lord wants us to do and so God set the tunic as the standard amen and so uh, when we look at this uh, there's something about a tunic that you got to understand uh, they weren't ashamed when they were naked okay they were in innocence until they sinned now later, God starts telling us in the scriptures what brings nudity or shame. Where, where are the guidelines? God was chastening Israel and he says, uncover thy locks, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the waters. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, they sh thy shame shall be seen. So now God is telling us what's involved in what's bringing shame and nudity God was saying this is what's this is what constitutes shame they weren't ashamed when they were nude but now God has set a standard what did God do what 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 design you know it wasn't Tommy Hilfiger what design did God do he gave them tunics he gave them both tunics okay what is a tunic anybody know what a tunic is you might have your own concept of a tunic but what a tunic is is a loose-fitting garment that goes from the neck to the below the knee or down to the ankle anywhere in that area with sleeves that covers underneath the rib area and under the arms so a tunic is something that goes to the neck covers from the neck down to below the knee and has sleeves that's what God said is modest when they were naked and they were ashamed now God gave them the standard of modesty in the garden. Okay? Now, does that mean you men have to wear tunics? No, that's not what I'm saying. But that coverage is what God is looking for. God doesn't want us to bear our thighs or our chests or our bosoms for the ladies. He wants us covered at least down to here. That's what God views as modest, and I'm not going to argue with him. That makes a whole lot of sense to me to agree with God on a standard of holiness and dress and our apparel. So what we as believers need to understand is we don't want to expose these areas of our body to anyone in public like that. That's... That's what God views as modest. That's not Brother Huba's standard. That's not Brother Eric's standard. God established the tunic. Now, there's debate on how far the tunic needs to go. Some of them were below the knee, there at the knee, and, and then others went down to the foot. But you know, if you take the minimum, that is the minimum that God 
says is a, is a holy, modest apparel. And it needs to be loose-fitting. Not showing the form of the body or the silhouette of the body like that. You know, I, I've seen some girls at church camp that had long dresses down to their ankles, but it was so tight it looked like they were poured in it and you could see every shape of their body. That's not modest. That's ungodly. That's not what God is looking for. God is looking for an unrevealing situation. For the, for, see, there's a reason for that. One, now that sin has entered in, guys are wired different than girls. We're visual. Ladies, if you would get inside a man's head for 24 hours, you would be shocked at how he deals with things. We're very visually stimulated by the opposite sex. That's just the way God made us. Now, Casanovas, they know how women are wired. They, they, they know women are more emotionally connected, and they respond to touch and emotional touches. Okay? So guys that know how to manipulate girls to get what they want out of them, they're very kind and compassionate and understanding, and they t hold your hand, and, and you just melt. <laughs> Where guys are... They notice the body. So God understood all this when he made the standard of holy and modest dress. God understood all that, okay? So, you know, mature men and Christian men have learned when not to take that second look because women, a woman's body is an attraction to a man's eyes. That's just the way a man is. It doesn't make him sinful, now, it can become sinful. That's why more men are hooked on pornography than women, although they're, it's starting to catch up. The women are starting to catch up with the stats. But what we have to understand is, is that as Christian ladies, thank you, ladies, for coming and bringing a spirit of holiness and godliness into a church service. Thank you that I can worship God and not have to battle with my eyes. You know, Job said, I've made a covenant with mine eyes. Why should I look then upon a young maiden? I've got to focus. I've got to keep my eyes. It's, it's that looking at a billboard and not looking again, taking that second glance. That's what the devil wants to do to a man, okay? Men battle that. Every man here, wave your hand if I'm, if I'm telling the truth. Sure, that's the way God made us. Women are different. They have other issues. They deal with other things. Some of you back there dancing around. Okay, that doesn't make us evil. Right? I have to control my mind. I have to watch what I look at. I have to guard my eyes. Uh, I thank God they stopped those uh, ladies selling hot dogs on the side of the road. My goodness, it was horrible here a few years back. It's like, oh, I didn't want to see that. Kids, look at Daddy right now. Don't look out the window. We're looking straight ahead. I mean, they were half naked. Right out on the side of the road selling hot dogs. I mean, one guy was photographing a girl on the hood of his car, and it's like, you got to be kidding me. And it's just pornographic what she was doing. I thought, oh, Lord, we're, we're in Sodom and Gomorrah right now. Okay. Well, that's the way a guy is wired, okay? So modesty is really, it helps the guys when you ladies are modest. I would much rather you bring in that holy environment to where I can worship God with my sister and not be tempted because you're revealing parts of your body that I'm wired to look at. Okay, I'm just being plain. Okay? Thank you. Because I don't want to have to close my eyes all the time to worship. There have been times, you know, and, and a, a mature man knows. I mean, there's times that clothing reveals things. You, you learn to look away. You know, you don't stare. You don't do those things. Because holiness to a man is in his mind more than what he wears. Because now I'm not saying women aren't physically or attracted by looks, but, you know, in the most part, a woman struggles not lusting after the way the man dresses. I mean, she might look at his face. Maybe some of you are going, you don't know women, brother. You will, but, you know, that's basically the way God made us. Women are more emotionally persuaded through acts of kindness, through 
uh, you know, just being a Casanova. You know, that's the way, you know, it's dangerous when, when, when a man understands that and is on the prowl because he can manipulate women very easily because that's just the way God made you. You respond to that. Guys respond to, to the visual, okay? So God said, okay, there's a distinction here. What, I, what we need is we need is loose clothing so the man doesn't deal with the silhouette. Okay, it's not clinging to your body, accentuating parts of your body, trying to be seductive. See, you know in your heart, ladies, how you dress, whether you're doing it to attract people to look at you. You know that. And when you look in the mirror, you know how to look seductive or you know how to look godly. It's just what you want. What is the motive, the way you're dressing? Is it to please God? Is it to show glory to God? Or are you trying to attract somebody to look at your body? Only you and God know that, okay? And so that's a good indicator when you start to dress yourself, ladies, uh, in modesty, is that, remember, what God said is the reason now, I'm not a clothesline preacher, you know that, uh, but I believe in modesty. You know, some churches have so many fingers down from the neck, and that's where the line is and all that stuff. Uh, I, I really think if, if I see cleavage on women in the church, it's too low. A tunic is from the neck down, okay, with sleeves. You know why sleeves are important? Because you can raise your arm and you can see the, the side of somebody's body through a, a, a sleeveless shirt. So you, put, you have a sleeve on there. Now, I, I've, I've got, as a pastor, some rules for people on the platform. You know, I don't want any of these cap sleeves up here while you're praising God and I'm seeing bra straps or if you wear one, you know, hello. I mean, I, I'm worshiping God. Can I be honest? And I'm going, ugh. You know, and then I got to fight that image out of my mind for my precious sister. It's like, come on, ladies, you know. I want to worship God here. Can you help us out? Amen. We want to please God in all that we do. This is, this isn't fo this is reality. That's why God set the standard, not man. Man's standard changes all the time. It does. It changes. All. But he made them both tunics. They both had the same areas covered. Okay? And Jesus even went a little better because we read where Jesus was clothed down to the foot. Okay. Now, I'm not saying you've got to clothe yourself down to the foot, ladies, but uh, I remember when I was a young man, they had maxi skirts. That was the fad. And they were real long skirts and all that. And I'm like, hmm, nothing wrong with that. That's just a fad of the world, though. That left and the miniskirts came back, you know. Because the devil wants to allure the mind of a man and he does it through sight. That's why men, our battle is, our holiness is in here. We've got to guard our eyes. We've got to be mature. We have to discipline ourselves. We have to be full of the Spirit to resist the natural tendencies that we have as men. Ladies, you, wanna, you know by nature how to attract a man. You can attract them by your dress. You can make yourself seductive. You can make yourself appealing for him to look at. And really, that, the reason that you don't want to do that is because that needs to be reserved to your husband. And if you're not married, preserved for your husband. You understand what I'm saying? We need to, we need to be very careful with that. It's a very powerful thing uh, that a woman has over a man. And it takes a very strong, disciplined man, a spiritual man, a mature Christian to be able to deal with some things without falling. And so, brethren, our battles, a lot of our battles in our minds. Now, uh, God actually did not even want the priests to go up by steps to the altar like the pagans did because he didn't want them to be able to look up under their tunics to see anything. They actually eventually wore breeches. You ever hear the term breeches? They're pants. And they would wear those to cover their, their thighs so when they went and officiated and did things that there was no nudity being exposed 
uh, in that area. Now, uh, here t Paul writes to Timothy, he says, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves, and Brother Eric's going to be uh, talking about uh, adornment uh, next week, and, but here he gets into the areas of the, uh, adornment. Modest apparel. Modest apparel. He's saying that women ought to be dressing in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. So that's very important because this is which becometh, uh, which becometh women professing godliness to good works. Okay, so if you're professing to be a Christian and a godly woman, then you need to dress modestly. That's important to God that you do that. Peter says, whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of the plaiting of hair, the wearing of gold, or the putting on of apparel. Okay, don't, don't use your body and the ornamentation and the clothing that the world has to, to show beauty. He says, as a Christian, he says, don't let that be what you're doing. He says, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament... Not, not all kind of jewelry hanging over you, but ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God at great price. For after this manner, the, uh, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being subject to their own husbands. Isn't that, isn't that, who did that? Holy women of old. You want to, and, and the apostle Peter's using them as an example for the Christian ladies in the New Testament church. This is the way you ought to do it, the way the holy women of old did it, okay? It's not the outward. Now, is this modest? Absolutely it's modest. <laughs> you can't get much more modest than that and breathe. But is that what God said? No, that's not what God said. That's what some religion said. So it's extreme. It's modest, but it's extreme. And it's not what God set as a standard of modesty when man fell in the garden. So we don't embrace that. Uh, if I thought that covering every inch of somebody's body would make them holy, I would, I would veil them, <laughs> you know. But it's not going to do it. It's not what God prescribed. God said, this is what will work. And I'm glad he did. Amen. And so, modesty has its root in moderation. That's not moderate. God, what God has is moderate. It's functional. It's livable. It's doable. God's not an idiot, okay? He just says, I know what's going on with man now because his mind's sinful. And I know what's going on with a woman, and they have problems too. They're vain, and they'll use their body to seduce a man. So, I've got to set a standard to where I can eliminate that or help stop that in society and some people feel modesty and holiness can be cloned everyone wears the same uniform well we our clothing identifies us we know who the Amish are the Mennonites it, so they have a dress standard they think their dress code saves them it's part of their salvation well it, you can't dress a certain way and be saved but like I said, once you're saved, you will dress a certain way. You'll dress modest according to the Word of God. And so, again, it's modest, but it's extreme. It's not what God said. They've gone overboard, okay? God didn't put that on mankind. Their religion did. That's why you need to know what the Bible says. And when somebody says, why, why do you wear dresses, lady? You need to say, uh, my, my Bible teaches me that this is the way God taught us and this is what we do because we love God and we want to please God. You don't say, my dad makes me do it or my, the pastor teaches it, my church says it. That's not why we do this. Whatever God says is what we want to do as Christians. Now, if you're not a Christian, you know, somebody that's new to Christianity, they're not going to know all this. I, I was just thinking when I first got saved, I was so excited about getting the Holy Ghost and you don't, nobody expects a new Christian to know all this stuff or to know everything. It takes time. That's why holiness is a process. It's a lifelong journey, really. God's still working on me. He's still 
clipping here and sanding here and smoothing this out. And so, and I don't want them to ever stop, okay? I mean, I'm not the same person I was when I first got saved. I've grown a little bit. I've matured in holiness. I mean, I can remember, I was so excited, I wanted to get involved in everything, and we had a lot of acreage, and, and, and so I got on a tractor and was cutting grass, kind of like what we do over here. And, you know, well, I'm young. I'm 21 years old. I just take my shirt off and get some sun out there in the back 40, you know? And so, you know, I'm on church property, and I'm half-dressed. Well, I don't think nothing of that, you know? But I remember seeing the pastor way in the back. He's walking towards me with his teenage daughter. And something said, put on your shirt. I don't know why I thought that, but I just was compelled to put on my shirt. Well, you know, God bless Brother Pamer. He didn't say, you know, Brother Mark, I know you're new, but, you know, I don't want you to be out here on church property with your shirt off. He never said that to me. He was so kind to me and just shook my hand. He's, and, and never said a word. I don't even know if he even remembers the incident, but I did. I'd have felt so stupid if he'd have said that to me because I didn't know. I didn't. I was innocent. I was just, I didn't think about, I thought, I didn't know there was such a thing as modesty. I mean, I, I come out of the world. The world doesn't know these things, and neither, they don't care about them. You only care about this if you love God and you want to please God. If you don't want to do that, that's okay. God will let you dress any way you want to. But when in the garden, he said, here's what's going to be the proper covering for a man and a woman, and these are the areas that are not to be exposed. Your thighs, your, your midsection, and your chest, and, and everything, you guard yourself. So God designed the clothing, amen, and it's loose-fitting. It's not form-fitting. So we can't, we can't clone it, but it is possible to be... A, to be an individual and look modest and holy and still look up to date. You don't have to be cloned. You can be an individual person. But you just dress the way you cover the parts of the body that God wants you to cover. Okay, that's all. God doesn't care what color shirt you wear. Now, if you're going to wear white and you're going to go swimming, I would say get something else because it's going to show through see-through stuff and stuff like that, you've got to be careful. Why? Because it's immodest. In and of itself, it's not, but there are certain conditions where it can be extremely immodest. I remember when I was in the world, they had wet T-shirt contests. I don't need to explain what that's about okay. because of the type of material, and they were white shirts, and you might as well have nothing on when it gets wet. Hello? I'm just being real. We live in the world. And wives, whether you... I, I, the dumbest thing I ever heard a wife tell me was, I don't care if he looks, he just can't touch. What? Are you kidding me? you got to be kidding me. You don't have a clue how a man's mind works. You don't look. You guard yourself from that stuff. That's just the way we are. And so, please, smack him in the head if he's looking. Say, get your eyes on me, buddy. That's right. Focus on your wife, brethren. The Bible says, delight thyself in the breasts of the wife of thy youth. Don't be running around looking at other women. Hey, man, it's, your, it's my first wife that I love the most. Of course, she's my only wife, too. But. All right, so garments like this are taboo, aren't they? Halter tops. Sleeveless dresses or blouses, shorts that are not that are uh, there. See, there is a distinction between uh, the identity of a man and a woman in dress, isn't there? Okay, that's a universal symbol. Notice that it's not English next to it. I've flown around different countries and they use the same symbols throughout many of the nations of the world, and so. Uh, Clothing identifies us as male and female. And we're going to talk about that because this is really important. This is why ladies wear dresses. Okay? You thought it was just because of Deuteronomy 22 and 5, but it's not. It goes back to the garden. It goes back through the Bible. See, the tunic, throughout the Scriptures, only the man 
girded up his loins. Now that means he pulled up the flap and tucked it in the belt. And there was a dividing of the legs. Okay? That's why a man wears pants. But for a woman, God said it's a silhouette thing. And above the knee, the thigh, God doesn't want us to see any dividing of the legs in a woman. Why? Because a woman opens up her legs to her husband. It's a sensual thing. When a man sees the dividing of legs, it it's, works totally different on a woman than it does on a man. When a man sees the dividing of the legs, that is not what God, that was what God was guarding against. Now I'm being plain. Okay? But that's why God has a standard like this. Form loose fitting, covering the arms from the neck down below. Nowhere in the scriptures, when God said, gird up the loins, it was always to a man. And it was usually in a term he was telling them because only men did it. Like Jeremiah was whining and complaining to God. God said, gird up your loins. In other words, man up is what he was saying. He was telling them, act like a man because only a man, that was a biblical term of God saying, stop your whining, you big baby, act like a man. Okay? Because under those terminologies, only the man girded up his loins. Okay? But he still didn't, he had to guard his legs. I mean, he, he still had to guard his thighs. Even though it was pulled up tight, the garment still covered down to the knee. But he could run in it faster. He could do better with it, work in it. Now, what about, when I was a young boy, it was very common where I grew up out in the country to see women out in the garden working, and they would have their, it was like bibbed overalls on because they was bending over and hoeing and working in the garden, but they always had a, like a blue jean skirt around them. So they always looked like they had, the, the, the dividing of the legs was never seen, okay? Wonder where, wonder where that came from. That's the way it was when I was growing up out in the country. You'd see them out in the, in the garden working or out in the fields, and, and they had their bibbed overalls on like their husband, but then they had a, a, a wrap around them. That, that, that made them look like a dress. So they were guarded. Would I say that's modest? Yes, because the dividing of the leg wasn't there. The thighs weren't shown. They were covered up. But it was, it was enabling them to do the work and stay modest. So it's the dividing of the legs that God doesn't want to see in the silhouette of a woman. It's not whether it's pants or not, because the pants... Uh, as long as there's no silhouette or dividing of the legs, if it's covered, that's okay. But it, w when a woman wears pants and her legs show the dividing of the legs above the knee, that's not what God's after. And so that, that constitutes immodesty in the, in, the, in the standard of God. And so God had dress codes for the children of Israel for identification. He said, speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes on the borders of their garments throughout their generations. This wasn't a one-time thing. That they put upon the fringes of the border a blue, a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. Okay, so God said, put a blue ribbon in your hem of your garments. And it's going to be a reminder for you. And that ye... Seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, which, after which ye used to go a whoring, that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. God said, The Word of God is symbol, uh, symbolically put in your clothing so that you remember to keep yourself holy unto your God, to do the commandments of God, okay? Well, when God requires us modesty, He's put His Word in our heart, not in our clothing. And our clothing doesn't save us, but it reminds us, it shields us, because between my wife and I, 
That's a very private thing. And when my wife dresses modest, it preserves that relationship to stay private between us. It's a preservation of our marriage. And it brings the blessings of God into our relationship. And so it's something that, that we want to do and we want, to, we want it to be. Now, the Bible says here in Leviticus that ye shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not sow the field and mingled seed, neither shalt, uh, shall a garment mingled with linen and woolen come upon thee. God required certain ways for his people to dress even under the law of Moses. So this isn't a weird thing. The, the, the reason is that God wants to keep a distinction between a man and a woman. Now, Paul writes to the Corinthians, says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither uh, fornicators, nor adulterers, nor, uh, or excuse me, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves and mankind. None of these things that people do, if you have them in your life, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You'll be disinherited from the will. You know what the last testament is? The last will and testament? You know what has to make a, a will enforceable? The death of the testator. Jesus died and rose again. The will's in force. We have an inheritance. But you will be disinherited if you do certain things. Okay? God wants a man and a woman to be identifiably easy to recognize that they are a man or a woman. But we live in a day that's hostile against God's plan. They have the unisex look, and you can't even tell if it's a man or a woman anymore. That's a hostile, perverse attack on the order that God has created. God wants men to look like men, and He wants women to look like women. And he doesn't want our clothing to reflect the same for either one or or. He doesn't. Deuteronomy says, and, and I just really, I've really been meditating on this. I heard a few months ago, some uh, Brother Woodward talking about this, and it, it, I never looked at it that way. I had always uh, disagreed with a lot of the teachers that taught that this verse teaches that a woman shouldn't wear pants because it's not a cultural thing, okay? But he brought out something here because there's two, there's two different standards in this verse. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are an abomination to the Lord thy God. Now, I don't know if you understand how serious this is to God, but transvestites are an abomination in the eyes of God. That's in your Bible. Now you say, but that's Old Testament, Brother Huba. Let me tell you something. God never changes. Now, when he gave the law to the people of God, he said, there are certain things that I will make an abomination unto you. I don't care about that. That's not covering me now. God said, if I was under that dispensation, under the law, then it was an abomination. I didn't eat pork. I didn't touch things dead. It was an abomination to, to Israel to do certain things. It was something that they abhorred very much. Okay? But there are things that God said, these things are an abomination to me. They're something that I detest. All right? And God doesn't change, does he? So if it was an abomination in the Old Testament, it's still an abomination to God. Now, I don't care what our culture and our society, and in in, in, I know we've got to live in this world, but you can see how God views the transvestite lifestyle. God says, that is an abomination unto me to do that. And so a man... Brother Robert, if God said, don't put on any women's clothes, you'd go, got it. Not a problem. Okay? But we're living in a metrosexual day now, and men are becoming effeminate, and they're trying to blend and take away the masculinity and the femininity and blend it together. 
But God said here that a man shall not put on a woman's garment. But the distinction was made, and, I, and I've studied it out, and I have to agree with it. It says, but to the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man. In other words, if it resembles in any way or points to a man, a woman should not wear it. God wants to preserve your femininity, ladies. He wants you to be women. He wants you to be women, act like women, think like women, dress like women. He doesn't want you to be one of the guys on the crew. I went to see my oldest boy today and one of the workers there and, and walked by and uh, it was a young lady and she looked like a man. And he looked at me and said, Dad, I've been in here too long when the men start looking good to me. It was a girl that looked like a man. Now, I don't know what her lifestyle was. I have no, I'm not judging a woman. But that, I mean, her head was shaved and she had a ball cap on. And she conducted herself. She tried to sound rough like a man when she talked. It was sad. She was confused. She didn't know she was a woman. She was trying to take on masculinity and lose her femininity. <laughs> I am so glad I'm a man. And if I was a woman, I would be so glad I'm a woman. I don't want to be a woman. I have no desire to be a woman. God made me a man. I'm real comfortable being a man. I'm not confused about my gender. I'm not going to go to a judge and get my birth certificate changed to make me female. They're doing that. Our world is confused, folks. They don't know the difference between a man and a woman. Our society is so confused, they can't figure it out. They don't know who they are. It's pathetic. Are we going to join that mess? Now, please don't, I'm not against anybody and all the homosexuals and gays and lesbians and all that. We love their souls in that. We, we welcome them to come and be saved. We're, we're not, I'm not criticizing. They're sinners. They do what sinners do. But we're not sinners. We were sinners. Now he's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay? I want to save the homosexual. I want to save the transvestite. I, I, have, a, I have a burden to do that because they're souls. I don't, I don't look at them like they're freaks or anything. They're just sinners. They're doing what sinners do. They sin. But saints shouldn't follow along in that. You know, the world's always trying to compromise. It's always trying to get you to compromise. So, the Lord blotted out the handwriting of ordinance against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Aren't you glad? Jude says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common self of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend, everyone say contend, for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. We are in a fight to keep truth alive. The world wants to snuff us out. Now, the reasons to maintain a moral commandment, the reasons to be modest, amen. It was designed to help preserve the distinction of sexes. All right? Along with other scriptures. God wants women to be women. You young girls, don't get confused with this world. You were born female. Thank God for that. You wouldn't want to be a man. And no man here wants to be a female because we weren't born that way. Don't let the, the foolishness and the ungodliness of this world confound you and confuse you into thinking you don't know what you are. Don't fall into that trap. That's exactly what the world's trying to do. That's why God's designed a modesty and a dress style that will cause you to be a lady. Amen. And God hates when we try to blend it in together. It's an abomination to Him. And anything that's an abomination to God 
I automatically adopt it in my life. I don't want no parts of that. So in discord's an abomination to God too. Don't want no part of that either. That's right. Not just clothing and things of that nature. So, the point being, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever. He doesn't change. All right? Peter says, after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being subject to their own husband. Point being, holy women of old lived by Deuteronomy. They didn't do things that pertain to men. Now, what do we do if I wear women's pants versus men's pants? Because women have clothing. And, and really, ladies, I understand and I appreciate all the effort, I understand that the, the clothes designers today are not godly people, so they're not really interested in modest clothes. They're, they're trying to promote it to be. Matter of fact, let's look at this. This is a, a, a clip out of the Washington Post I got. It says here that when the designer Yves Saint Laurent first encouraged women to wear trousers more than 30 years ago, his reasons were not simply because pants are comfortable and practical. He knew that the sight of a woman draped in the accordment of, of a man is sexually provocative. This is a worldly clothes designer. This is his statement. Here it is. A woman was embracing something forbidden. That is an ungodly worldly clothes designer over 30 years ago making a statement when he started trying to design pants for women that he said he knew it was a provocative sexually provocative thing and it was a forbidden thing for women to do now if he knew that why don't the people of God know that hello God's not putting anything on us than what's necessary he made life. He made the human body. He made the human anatomy. And I appreciate the ladies that, that go and, and shop and try to dress modest and you come in here godly. And if you, I know a lot of the fashions are low cut and I'll see some of you, you know, you got, you've sewn pieces of material across there to cover yourself and to be modest. I commend you on that. Thank you. Thank you because I, you're bringing in a godly environment into the church, into the house of God, into worship. Amen. And don't you know that God's going to bless when we honor Him in His Word, when we dress modestly, when we come in and we're mindful of these things. And, we're, and you're, ladies, you're not distracting a brother with your body, but you're enabling him to worship God freely and he's not guarding his eyes. I mean, we can't control sinners coming in and we don't want to dress sinners coming in. We understand that. I wouldn't offend them. I, we're glad they're here. But we're talking about spiritual growth. We're talking about being Christians and maturing in the holiness. And that's what we want to do. We want to be a holy people. Well, Jesus said, clean the inside first. I got to do that. That's first order of business is that my heart's right. I'm not rebelling against God. I'm not mad at God. I'm not telling God no. But I'm submitting myself, I'm cleaning myself inside. Jesus said, you people that look holy on the outside and aren't are hypocrites. You know, if we just said, okay, this is the way you're going to dress here at the upper room and, and that's our holiness and you do it for those, that's no more than legalism. That's not what this is about. This is about letting the Holy Ghost inside of you grow out. Jesus said, clean the inside of the cup first, that the outside may be clean also. He said, you dudes look like a bunch of painted, whited sepulchers, you're, but you're stinky inside. You, you, you're full of rot and decay. Your spirits are all wrong. You're full of dead men's bones. And the sinner that came to Jesus was more justified because they were beating themselves in the chest saying, I'm unworthy, have mercy on me, a sinner. So we don't want to, we're not living a holy separated lifestyle 
to make somebody else less holy, if, that's your, if you think you're more holy than somebody else, you've missed it and I've failed you tonight. Because it's not you becoming holy to look holier than thou and to be holier than these. We, we live a holy separated life unto the Lord because this is what pleases Him. And whatever pleases Him pleases me. You don't get an argument out of me. If you don't want to do it and you fight and you rebel against it, then you're really not growing in holiness. And if you're not growing, you're dying. And it's kind of like catch-22. You're not saved by doing these things, but if you don't, you rebel against these things, and rebellion is a sin of witchcraft, and you're going to be lost. But you have to do it for the right reasons. If you're not doing it because you love Jesus, don't do it. If you don't want to please God, don't do it. You're wasting your time. It's, God's not going to accept that. But if you do it and the Holy Ghost is teaching you and you, He's conforming you to be in the image of Christ, wow, that's powerful. And not only are you preserving your relationship with your spouse or future spouse, ladies, you're also enhancing the worship in the church. You're bringing the holiness of God in here. And that's powerful. Churches that live a holy lifestyle have powerful you go to churches that don't have a holiness lifestyle if they think ah I'm not going to do that I'll do what I want to do they don't have what we have they don't have the spirit we have they don't have the move of God in their presence and the anointing that we have and God's merciful and he loves those people and he's working with them but I don't want to rebel against the teaching of the Lord Adam and Eve could have took those coats and threw them down and said I want my apron back I think that's enough they could have, but you know what? Something inside of me tells me they were so ashamed, even with their covering, that they were hiding, that when they got God's covering, they were thankful because it covered the right amount and it made them to where they weren't ashamed in the presence of God and they weren't hiding from Him. Oh, I'm telling you, it's a small thing, but it's a big thing. Because when this leaves, when holiness leaves your life, it opens the door for anything else to come in. It's kind of like the vanguard of your walk with God. Because you're maturing into holiness, and holiness is teaching you. When it's no longer important, and, and please understand, you're going to see people at various levels of holiness in a church. Not everybody grows at the same rate. Not everybody comes in at the same time. You know, I don't expect uh, the young men to be as holy as Brother Quakenbush. He's lived for God many years. He's, God's beat him up a lot of times. <laughs> no, the Lord's taught him. He's instructed him. Amen. We're not, we're not clothesline preaching here. We're instructing you on what pleases God and what God's looking for in apostolic Christian believers. Amen. Because it's His Word. Not because it's a church standard, it's the God standard. He's the clothes designer that I want to buy my clothes off his shelf. And so, you know, I, 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 men, men kind of fit in any way they dress. As long as we're modest and we're covered too, we still have the same standard. Only the women just don't divide the leg. They don't show the division of the leg. That's the only difference. That's it. And that's a God thing, and that's a wise thing. You ask any man here uh, that sees a woman in pants, it's more sensual. You have to guard your eyes. It shows the woman's crotch. Can I be plain? God didn't intend that to be shown. All right? I, I know I'm not going to shock you. You hear worse things than that at school. God's guarding your purity. Okay? He's guarding your purity. And He wants you to be pure unto Him and for your husband or your future husband. That's what God wants. And so a man doesn't have to fight. When, when he can't see the division, he doesn't have to fight the look. And he can worship God freely. You didn't know men were such a mess, did you, ladies? That's the way He wired us. I'm not ashamed of it. That's the way God made me. I deal with it. 
Okay? I'm just being... Every man here knows I'm saying it right. Okay? And this is how we can help one another. And your holiness and your modesty is a, is, is a defense to this church. Men lift up holy hands without wrath, doubting nothing. We're the offense of the church. But you women defend us with your holiness and your purity. And it's beautiful. Amen. Well, you've been very attentive. I'll close here. I hope I gave a little bit better understanding on why we dress the way we do as, as Christians and what the Bible has to say about that. Because it's important that you understand that and that you do it not because you have to, but because that you want to. You want to you mature. You want to perfect. That word perfecting means maturing in holiness unto the Lord. And when you do that, you're going to feel better about yourself. It's kind of like you can dress the way you want to dress and you're going to be ashamed. But when you dress with what God says, there is no shame in that. And there's peace and there's clarity of mind and spirit. And you can do more for God. Because, you know, if you can get the little things right, how many want to be used of God? I do. If you can get the little things right, That's what this is. This is a little thing. I marvel sometimes. I've, I've had people confront me and want to change my mind that God didn't know what he was doing. Like, you have no right to teach this. If I'm not in the book, then I have no right to teach it. But if I'm in the book, and I am, then you have every reason to agree with it, embrace it, do it. And if you'll do that, you'll be the ones that are going to benefit. You're going to take yourself to another level in God. You know, if this is meat to you, then you're still a baby. Because a lot of this stuff, I, I taught myself and the Holy Ghost taught me. I just studied it out in the Word. Because I cared what pleased God. I wanted to know what God expected of me. I didn't expect that he saved me just to, just to put my carcass on a pew and me not change. I understood that there were things in my life, that's why I didn't serve God. Because I knew if I did, I would have to change. As a sinner, I knew what Christians did. I could find a hypocrite real easy. Oh, they're supposed to be Christian and they're doing that? I knew that was wrong. And they're saying they're a Christian, and I wasn't professing Christianity. So I knew before I came to God that, Cuba, you're going to have to change some things in your life if you're going to do this Christian scene. So I wasn't afraid of changing. And you know what I found out? I like the new work here. I like them a whole lot better than the old one. I like what God's made. You might not like it. It really doesn't matter. But I, to be liked by people. If God's happy with me, He's saying, "Good job, you. I knew I could count on you to do it right. I'm okay with that." If everyone else thinks I'm just kind of a reject and, and, and weird and whatever, that's okay. That's okay. As long as God says you're on it, you're the man.
them to embrace a godly lifestyle. It, it takes consistency. Amen. Be the Lord's woman. That's Brother Eric. 